Oj, nu är jag. Terence Myers. To what do we owe the pleasure this time? I... Taft is coming to town today. The American president? Not an official visit. He's simply en route to his summer home in Quebec. The prime minister has picked our station to provide security. Because of the trust we've earned. No, only because your station is closest to where Taft will be disembarking. He's getting off at the Don station. By the bloody pig packers. Mm. The Americans insisted on it. We believe it's intended to humiliate Laurier by meeting with him in the worst possible part of Toronto. Oi. So, I've drafted an itinerary, gentlemen. Please familiarize yourselves with it. You're leaving. Yes, the uh, problem is there isn't on Project Aardvark. Why Aardvark? Oh, national security. Huh? Well, not national security. The last one was Zebra, and we're... Well, we're back to A. So. Thank you. Suspicious death at the telegraph office. The one on the corner? Hmm. The alphabet. Very clever. I like that. What have we, Henry? John Doe, sir. Collapsed while he was talking on the telephone here. And what makes this death suspicious? Apparently, the window shattered at the very moment he collapsed. More curious than suspicious, I suppose. <clears throat> I was here when it happened. I, I figured he had been shot. Mrs. Hart? Uh, no sign of any external wound, but bleeding from the nose and the ears. Thank you. What else could cause that? A severe blow to the head, but there's no indication of such. Hmm. Well, that is curious. I've looked everywhere, sir. No bricks, no rocks. Henry, windows don't simply shatter themselves. If something was thrown, sir, it's gone now. Henry, at what time did this man collapse? Uh, 10 15, sir. I'd like you to stay a little while until you're feeling better. Over Just here. take a seat. Have a seat. <sighs> Another one's just come in. This is Dunnigan. Mm. Dizziness as well as headache and what she calls tummy flutter. How many is this now? Five. Well, it's six if you include the woman who saw angels hovering over her. It's very odd. Nurse Sullivan is calling it East End Syndrome. East End? That's where most of them live. Except for Mrs. Follows, who lives in church. Perhaps this is environmental. A localized toxin. How many is still here? Just Mrs. Dunnigan and Mrs. O'Connor. Find out exactly where they were before and during their symptoms. Contact the others as well. I want to track this down. All right. Bleeding out his nose and ears. Yes, sir. Presumably caused by severe trauma. Yet he wasn't assaulted at the telegraph office. Maybe before. The witnesses also stated that the back window smashed at the very moment he collapsed. Coincidence? I thought so as well, but then I found this in his pocket. 10.15, number 8. The precise time and place of his death. Mm. I've never seen anything like it. His intestines have ruptured and his lungs have collapsed. But he had no visible injuries. Not just that. He wouldn't have been able to walk into the telegraph office in such a condition. He could have neither stood nor breathed. Yet he was alive and well moments before he collapsed. Somehow this happened to him there. I have no idea how. Mrs. Darby lives across the river on Monroe Street. She left her house at half past nine to go to her job at the House of Providence. And who's left? Uh, Mrs. Ball. Which one was she? Unsettling thoughts and stomach discomfort. Yes, she thought she had a ghost inside her. Where did she go? Uh, she lives at the corner of Parliament and Sydenham and was going to visit her friend at Toronto General Hospital, but she went to buy flowers on Queen Street at Hannigan's. That's where she started to feel funny. 
Well, and there it is. All of these people start and end their trips at different places, but they all pass through this intersection right here. Hmm. Henry? Uh, thank you. Have you been able to interview everyone? All those I can track down, sir. Right. Well, let's begin with all of those who observed our John Doe prior to his collapse. That would be... Oh, William! What are you doing here? Julia, what are you doing here? I, I thought this was a clinic day. Well, it is, but I've become somewhat of a detective myself this morning. Hmm? I've uncovered the most unusual syndrome, manifesting in symptoms both physical and psychological. Spiritual, actually. Spiritual? Yes, my patients report seeing ghosts and angels, and they all pass through this intersection at the same time. What time was this? Just after 10 o'clock, but it's hard to be specific. Did any of them happen to come through this telegraph office by chance? I don't think so. Why? Julia, a man died here at 10.15 this morning. He experienced severe internal trauma and, and what... Now you've... Henry, of the people you interviewed, did any of them experience... Uh, what are the symptoms? Headaches, uh, internal discomfort, and apparitions. What, like ghosts? Or angels. No angels, but I've got ghosts. Um, a Clement Bragg said he felt the ghost of our John Doe pass through him the moment he collapsed, but I think he'd been... Ah, uh, anyone else? Yes, Mrs. Jarvis said she wanted to help John Doe, but felt the hand of God holding her down. Oh, well, that's curious. Also, one of the switchboard operators said she saw an aardvark, but <laughs> she was obviously a loony. Please take us to her. It was nothing. I just had one of my episodes, is all. Episodes? They're not exactly fits. I don't fall down and start kicking about. You experience petite mal seizures? Just once in a while. I can feel them coming. I get crazy notions, but I don't act crazy. You say you saw an aardvark? Just before I blacked out. Flew off. Flew? Some kind of bird, isn't it? Thank you, Miss Clark. How fascinating. I suspect her seizure was triggered by the same event that affected my patients and your John Doe. She doesn't know what an aardvark looks like. I'm not entirely sure myself. Then how could she have seen one? Well, certain types of epilepsy can cause hallucinations, visions. Do you think it's possible that she overheard someone say the word aardvark? It's possible. Why? Because it's the name of a secret government mission. What are the odds the word aardvark would come up twice in one day? Uh. Inspector, has Calvert Weston arrived? Who? The American attache. What's he look like? If he were here, you'd know him. Can I help you, sir? No. And he's here. Mr. Weston, welcome to Toronto. This is Inspector Brackenreed. Received my telegram? I did. We're ready to discuss your requests. They're not requests. They're requirements. Hmm. Which we are doing our utmost to fulfill. At bloody short notice, by the way. Perhaps it would be best if I were to clarify our position. This meeting is at the request of your Prime Minister and serves Canadian interests. Uh, President Taft agreed because he's already in the country for personal reasons and views this as a courtesy. That is understood. It has no official bearing and any undertaking will be devoid of effect. Now, as you know, this is the President's first visit outside the United States since Mexico and we do not want to repeat of what happened there. Of course, security is our highest priority. To that end, I'm in charge of every person's conduct to me, and that includes you and the employees of the station. Now, hold on. I understood. This visit will be conducted with absolute secrecy. No press, no photographs. The president will have no physical contact with any other person save your prime minister, who will be afforded a single handshake upon arrival and departure. Any breach, and this visit will be aborted. Is there any of this that is not understood and accepted? It was understood. Understood, yeah. The President's train will arrive in one hour and 50 minutes. Let us proceed. <clears throat> we need to talk. Another time, Murdoch. 
It has to do with your aardvark project. You go on ahead. You want me to go with him? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Excuse me, doctor. What do you know? A man is dead. Others have been sickened. Wasn't supposed to be lethal. Hmm. So, last fall, several employees at our Toronto headquarters started experiencing periods of acute discomfort, which subsided after a moment or two. We assumed it was the Belgians. The Belgians? Yes, their consulate is directly across the street. Then you don't trust them. Does anyone? Uh, you believe the Belgians created some kind of secret weapon? We did, but we were wrong. It turned out that these attacks were emanating from a sump pump that had become unbolted in the building's basement. And the vibrations traveled through the building? Exactly. Once the sump pump was reattached, the problem stopped, but it got us thinking. What if it could be a weapon? Of course it did. I mean, the potential for crowd control was obvious, but there were other applications as well. Such as uh, murder? This will go a lot faster if you let me do the talking, Murdoch. Hmm? We contracted a German scientist by the name of Klaus Meisner to design the device. Uh, what frequencies is he using? Uh, between 10 and 20 cycles per second, with 13 being the default. So below human hearing. Yeah. It was a fortunate coincidence that the frequency with the greatest effect also turned out to be undetectable. And what is the effect? Discomfort, nausea, headache, mostly. Well, that would align with the experience of my patients. I tested it myself. It's unpleasant to be sure, but certainly not deadly. And yet a man is dead. In manners and circumstance, deeply connected to this project Aardvark. So, there's something else you should know. These devices have been stolen. We assume by Klaus Meisner. We also assume that he's responsible for this murder. Well, I wish you luck. I need to get back to the clinic. Oh, are you sure? My mystery solved. Sounds like yours is just beginning. <laughs> Shall we start with this John Doe? Yes. Oh. Do you know this man? Yes, I do. This is Klaus Meisner. Why did you think Klaus Meisner was behind this? He was kicking up a fuss. Suggested the program be canceled, the emitters destroyed. Why? Believe me, Murdoch, if I knew, I would tell you. Where did he work? I'll take you. We're on the top floor? Yes. The floor below is to be cleared and locked off. No one is staying there. I'll get my men on it. That would require me to trust their competence. Your men will patrol the periphery. Two on the roof, another two in each stairwell. Armed, of course. May get shotguns. Less chance of missing. You give me ten men and I'll pick six. We'll go with that chair. It's more sturdy. The president has a bad back. Now, where's the telephone? I'm expecting a call from the first lady. Who? The president's wife. Oh. The call will be coming at 5 o'clock. Tell the front desk to make sure that line is open. What time did Meisner die? 10.15. Why? Yeah. I was here at 11 looking for him. Left that in the door jam. Someone's been here. I may still be here. You! Step into view with your hands raised. Alexander Graham Bell. Detective Murdoch, what a surprise. I'm sorry, I don't believe we've met. Uh, Mr. Bell, this is Terence. He doesn't need to know my name. What are you doing here, Mr. Bell? I came at the request of Klaus Meisner. For what purpose? Oh, he wanted to use an instrument I'd built to measure subsonic vibrations. 
May I ask what all this is about? We believe a subsonic wave emitter built by Klaus Meisner was used to kill him. That's still speculation, Murdoch. Klaus is dead? My God. I, I spoke to him just this morning. He was supposed to meet me here at noon. <laughs> is this the emitter? It is. And unfortunately, the only one left in our possession. Gentlemen, would you like a demonstration? All right. Uh, stand no closer than 10 feet or you will experience the worst headache of your life. Uh. <clears throat> Ready? Yes. confess I had to retain strict control over certain muscles I only have excuse to use once a day. Common symptom. Some agents couldn't maintain any control. So, as you can see, effective crowd control, but even at this close range, the waves produced are not fatal. Yes, but Klaus Meisner is dead. What if several machines were aimed at him? Well, their waves would likely interfere with each other, and cancel each other out. Ah, if they were to converge at peak amplitude. Because. What? Well, if the emitters were equidistant, huh, and fired synchronously, the wave peaks would converge at a single point. The resulting amplitude would be the sum of each. So, say, ten emitters, precisely arrayed, would produce an amplitude ten times greater at the point of convergence. Yes, but keep in mind that the intensity will diminish to the square root of the distance. Of course. Mm -hmm. Just how many machines are missing, Myers? 78. 78? Oh, I suppose that could kill a man. Is this it? One vehicle. It was our understanding only the president and his driver would be leaving from the station. In full view with no protection. I want three cars, one in the front, one following. There will be no stopping between the station and the Dominion Hotel. These are Meisner's notes on the emitters. It seems he had the same idea as you, Mr. Bell. He'd even worked out the interference patterns. Well, I would have thought as much. He was serious about this. What are you two talking about? What the devil is an interference pattern? Well, when waves interact, they either amplify or destroy one another, creating nodes of high and low amplitude. Rather beautiful geometry. Hmm? Which would explain the effect on the people outside the telegraph office when Mr. Meisner collapsed. Hmm. They each occupied a different node. Huh. That makes sense. Oh. That's a film. That's Klaus Meisner. It appears he's conducting an experiment. Perhaps he's testing his theories. Who is that? Meisner's assistant, Rupert Lamar. Where is he now? We've yet to locate him. Good Lord. I can make you burst? I... I believe the wavelength emitted matched the resonant frequency of the watermelon, much like the voice of a soprano could shatter a wine glass. So what would be the resonant frequency of the human body? Different organs and materials would have different natural frequencies, but I suspect, given what we've seen, that it would be in the subsonic range. Meisner was targeted. How? Having separate waveforms converge at a single point would require Absolute precision in both location and timing. So how could they possibly know he was going to position himself in exactly the right place? Very true. A few feet to the side and the effects would have been very different. But he was at a specific place and time. He was on the telephone. Of course. 
Whoever triggered the devices was possibly on the phone with them at the time. How did he, did he call them? Or they called him. This note was found in Klaus Meisner's pocket, the, the man who died earlier. That's right. Telephone number eight at 1015. Yes. Now, what I need to know is who was on the other end of that call, or at the very least, whether it was placed or received. I can do you better than that. The call came from FP412, from a man called Grant Taylor. How did you... Mr. Meisner was expecting a call in booth eight and wanted to know who was going to be calling, so I wrote it down. Huh. Mr. Taylor? How is it that a witness to Mr. Meisner's collapse at the very same time called him from a telephone three blocks away? I have nothing to say. Oh, come now, Mr. Taylor. It was your phone call that ensured his death. You could be facing the noose. I have nothing to say. Put him in the cells. So we know the waveforms converged at the telegraph office here. So you're saying the emitters are located along these concentric lines here. Mm -hmm. How far apart are these? 87 feet, which corresponds to 13 cycles per second. Let's start kicking down some doors. Something's happening, Aya. Oh, move, both of you. I believe we're under attack. It's not that severe. We must be inside one of the nodes, but we're not the intended target. The cells. I don't understand. If the emitters were set along these lines in order to converge at the telegraph office here, then how were they able to converge at our station house here a block away? Could they have relocated every emitter? No, that would be impossible with such short notice. Mm. And Mr. Taylor was only in our station house for what, 15 minutes? Perhaps our assumptions were wrong. Meisner's emitters can fire at a range of wavelengths, correct? Correct. And they're able to swivel on their bases in any direction. But in order to be effective, they have to have their peak amplitudes converge at a single point. So, if each emitter was made to face a specific target and emit a specific wavelength, then they could target anyone within range? They would have to recalibrate the, the emitters very quickly. They must be set up to communicate wirelessly or something. Rupert Lamar, Meisner's assistant, was an expert in wireless transmission. But it makes no sense. They were like father and son. Why would he kill his mentor? And how did they know Taylor was in our cells? Unless he triggered the device himself. Unless he was merely a dupe. And if so, whom? Detective, my recorder is sonically activated whenever a vibration exceeds a certain threshold. Is it possible you've recorded it, then? Gentlemen, we are in luck. We may be able to determine how the emitters are arrayed based on relative amplitude and frequency. Eureka. I best get to work. I found something interesting on Mr. Taylor's finger. A tattoo was obscured by his ring. We've seen that before. Indeed we have. Three weeks ago, we uncovered evidence of a group of rogue agents calling themselves the Soldiers of Columbia. They're led by a former agent. You know him as Alan Clegg. Clegg? It's impossible. Clegg is dead. We've seen proof. Is this the proof you've seen? The tattoo was identical to this. But surely Alan Clegg didn't survive rabies and a tumble over Niagara Falls. 
The soldiers of Columbia are more than one man. You may recall we found the same tattoo on the hand of Agent Morris. It is their symbol. In any case, they've made their intentions clear. They want America to invade and annex Canada. And what better provocation than the assassination of the American president on Canadian soil using a covert weapon developed by the Canadian Secret Service? We need to talk to Prime Minister Lurie. We're certain Taft is the target. All we know for certain is that the soldiers of Colombia are involved. This is the worst news at the worst possible time. Yes, sir. We will have to cancel. No, it's too late to cancel. They've already disembarked from the train. They'll be here in a matter of minutes. Well, then we will inform them upon arrival. Would that even help? Didn't you just tell me that these devices... Emitters. ...can target anyone, anywhere? Not exactly, sir. Each emitter has to be individually recalibrated for each new location. It takes time. Then as long as Taft keeps moving, he'll be safe. Sir... But you saw how they reacted to Mexico. Consider the repercussions for Canada if this plot is ever revealed. Remember, we need this trade agreement far more than the Americans do. President Taft is arriving. This meeting is for less than an hour, followed by cocktails. We'll keep him moving. Sir, he'll want to sit down. Then we'll change the seats. And at all times, I'll keep close to him. If he dies, I die too. And in the meantime, find those damned emitters. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Lads, remember what we talked about? No one gets near the president. I'll inform the inspector. I'll see if Mr. Bell's had any luck. Mm. Let me through. Sorry, sir. Oh, for Thomas? Woody Elevin's letting through. Oh, we have a problem. Mind the curb, sir. Hmm. Your back hurts, sir. My nose hurts worse. Well, there's a pork pack implant to the south. Well, how many hogs does it take to create a smell like that? Must be in the thousands, sir. Hmm, they're an industrious people, Weston, but lacking in presentation. Are we really going through this? Gloria doesn't want a repeat of what happened in Mexico. What did happen in Mexico? A man was found ten feet away from Taft and Diaz with a palm pistol. Ooh, that's not good. Very much a non-event. No attempt was made on his life, but... Of course, the Americans used it very much to their advantage. Any luck, Mr. Bell? Well, as you know, I intended to infer the source from the amplitude and frequencies. And? Impossible. In fact, might I say blooming impossible. I was ready to call it quits when I discovered this. It starts exactly three minutes before the attack. Each pulse separated by one second, and each a unique wavelength. The emitters are firing in sequence. I believe we're looking at the primary wave, and this is the secondary phase. Of course. They're arrayed in straight lines. By Jove, yes. Two lines arrayed at right angles to each other. Right. If this is the station house, uh, what's the longest wavelength? Uh... 13.2, two wavelengths, 171 feet. So if we assume the direction of the telegraph office, 171 puts us at the intersection of Sumac and Queen Street. And the shortest is 100 feet. That's all this? We found out that the emitters are arrayed in two lines intersecting at this corner here. 100 feet puts us at the western edge of the Dominion Hotel. Where Taft and Lori are meeting. Could the emitters be hidden in the hotel itself? Only the top two floors have been secured. The soldiers of Columbia could have rented every room in the bottom two. Please continue your calculations, Mr. Bell. Henry, come with us. You check the basement, I'll start in on the first floor. Murdoch? 
I'll be right there. Sit down. Alan Clegg. Well. Hello, detective. I must confess, I'm delighted to see you, Detective. Oh? Why is that? Because as long as you're here, you're not out there. You see, you no longer present the threat of discovery. You should be happy as well, because you now have a front row seat to a defining moment in history. And what defines this moment? Your failure? Your arrests? Your execution? I had forgotten what a Charming conversationalist you are, Detective. Yes, there will be an execution, President Taft, of course, but uh, you as well. It's an unfortunate necessity, I'm afraid. But I would like you to know, Detective, that I harbor no ill will towards you personally. We know about your secret weapon. We also know its limitations. You can aim at a specific point, but not a moving target. Well... President Taft is rather a rotund fellow. How is it exactly that you intend on keeping him moving for a full hour? We don't have to. Each time he moves, you have to adjust every one of your emitters. That's 78 separate measurements, 78 separate calculations, and 78 commands. It's one measurement, repeated 78 times. If they're arrayed in straight lines equidistant, the same function applies to all. It only takes a few minutes to reset every emitter. Yes, we recorded your test transmissions. I know the exact wavelengths of each of your emitters. You don't know which direction. You don't know which wave. I was able to find you. And yet here you are, all alone. Who else in that little station house of yours could possibly figure it out? We have none other than Alexander Graham Bell doing the calculations as we speak. Go down, stay down. If anyone shows up, slit their throats. Mr. President, I'm sure you'll be more comfortable in the capacious wing back. It's made right here in Toronto. Are you here to sell me a chair? I'm here to sell you on everything Canada has to offer. It's changed his chair. Why? That one's got more support. I've got a bad back myself. Age. I don't like surprises. Next time, tell me. Ah! Did you find the emitters? No. They're not at the hotel. Nor are they at the brewery next door. We even checked the barrels. How odd. According to my calculations, they are in the immediate vicinity of that corner. Where's Detective Murdoch? What's your stake in this? You must know what these soldiers of Columbia want. I support their aims. You're Canadian. Canada is a pasty child, beholden to an indifferent mother who demands obeisance but gives nothing in return. I'd rather be American. 
So much so you'd be willing to kill for it? People die in war. It's the price of freedom. It's not like I know any of them personally. You knew Klaus Meisner? Klaus is dead. He's your first victim. He was to be left alone. He was on to our plan. It was necessary. We had an agreement. And I changed that agreement. I've had enough of this. Sit down. Be a man, swallow your grief, and do your job. Are the emitters ready? They need to be recalibrated. Why? The temperature has risen. It affects the density of air, which affects the wavelength. Then you best get at it. Because come five o'clock, either Taft dies or you do. Help me put a stop to this. If we fail, he'll shoot me. If we succeed, I'll be arrested for murder. So either way, my destiny is predetermined. When did you last see him? Yeah, at the front of the hotel. He didn't come in, as far as I know. Well, according to my calculations, the emitters are arrayed along the perimeter of the hotel. They're not there. We checked. Could they be buried underground? Not buried. In the sewers. Another attack. No, it's the pre-attack calibrations. That means another attack will begin in exactly three minutes. Mr. President, I want to thank you for your generous attention to our concerns. Are you asking me to move again? I don't want to presume to take more of your precious time than is necessary. You'll want to be on your way, I'm sure. Mm, nonsense. My wife is due to call here at 5 o'clock. That has been arranged. It has. Then I shall continue to rest my aching back. Look at the time that you two try to disable the emitter. Right. Are the emitters ready? Just finishing now. Good. I'll make the call myself. Oh, I wish I could see the look on his face when he hears my voice instead of his wife's. What do we do? We turn as many of the mitzvahs as we can in 60 seconds. Hello, operator. Connect me to the Dominion Hotel. Suite 401. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes? It's time. Oh, yes, we were expecting your call. Mr. President. First lady calling? Right on time. the president's life. Sincere apologies, sir. He saw I had a gun and didn't know I was Canadian Secret Service. 
I've never seen this man before in my life. My back? Did he injure you, sir? Oh, quite the opposite. I believe he's cured it. I just saved your life. And that of the American president. I'm very much aware of that. Facts that I will make clear to the Crown Attorney. But you can't possibly think that you're going to walk away from this. I wonder what happened with my wife's telephone call. I assume we misconnected, sir. We'll try again when you arrive in Kingston. Oh, well, she retires at 9 p.m. And that's less than four hours. My back thanks you, Prime Minister. I will consider your proposals. I'll await your reply. Hmm. Well, Mr. Weston, please stay behind. I don't have time. I'm afraid you'll have to let them leave without you. What are you doing, Murdoch? He was working with Clegg. I heard the other side of that phone call. It was your voice, wasn't it? Dr. Ogden. Detective? This is hard. Forgive the intrusion. When I heard the news, I wanted to see for myself. We've had something of a history with Agent Clegg here. He injected me with rabies. Well, he's certainly history now. It appears the Y section has already been done. Mm, it just looks that way. Now we get to do it for real. My goodness, Louise, this is all very impressive. It's remarkable how quickly one's life can change. Who would have thought a book about an insane killer clown would make Louise Cherry a household name? Uh, it's sold out all over town. I still haven't had a chance to read it. Oh, let me know what you think. Well, thank you. And whose idea was it to make a film? Mine. I wrote the scenario. Although it's not really writing. Hello, Alma. I told you, it's Lee. That's the actress who plays the killer, Lee Iverson. She takes her role very seriously. Why is a man playing the other clown? They were sisters. Yes, but there's only one killer in the movie version. Jack over there plays the part when the mask is on. Well, the audience noticed it was a different person. No, Julia, the people who watch these things aren't exactly the best and brightest. Oh. Louise. A thought in this scene, after the clown has killed young Miss Robbins, I want to take on the perspective of her paramour, watching on from the corridor. The murder is done. The clown is fled, but we hold as Perry watches in terror. And we hold? Marvelous. Forgive me, uh, why would you film a, a scene where one woman murders another woman from the perspective of a man who's merely observing? And who are you exactly? Claude, this is Dr. Julia Opton. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is a woman dead, and yes, there is a woman who killed her, but the scene hinges on the inaction of this inert man, neutered by fear and cowardice. But the man is the most interesting part. I is he? Claude, about the scene where I fight the clown, how scared should I be? Scared? Louise, were you scared when you fought off the killer and brought her to the police? I wouldn't say scared. Bravery personified. Mm. This, dear Francis, is the task before you to embody this vision of force and beauty. If you excuse us, Louise, we must prepare for the scene. Francis. Well, you're yes. certainly smitten with you. We're courting. Oh, how wonderful. <laughs> I'm so happy for you. <laughs> but did he mention that it's your character who fights and detains the killer clown? 
Yes. Well, that, that was me. I saved that young woman's life, not to mention my own. Of course. But there's only room for one heroine. Hmm. Quiet, everyone. Oh. It is time. We are prepared. We are ready. Quiet, please. Exciting, isn't it? Roll the camera. Camera's rolling. Slate in. Slate out. Cue the lights. And begin. You hear the telephone. Rise and cross. Good. Good. And answer. Hello? 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 But no one is there. It's just music. How odd. Replace the receiver and the doorbell. Oh, my. Whoever could that be? Now go to the door. Confused. Good. Pause. And now open the door. And... Oh, no! It's a clown! You're scared! Now he's inside and you're terrified! Where's Perry? Call for him! Perry! And the knife. Good, good. And pants on her. She is scared. And a tuck. Space. Yes. And again. This is and now, real. Retreat. And we hold. No, 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 something is wrong. <gasps> Julia! Miss? Miss, are you all right? Uh, miss, miss! Uh... It's real. The blood is... is real. She's dead! What in God's name? Constables are searching everywhere for a man in a clown costume. Jack Richard is no sign as yet. It was so awful, William. We just sat there and watched as he killed this poor girl. Miss Cherry, did you know the killer, Jack Richards? I met him briefly. Claude knew him. Detective, this is Claude Cordier, the director. Did you know Mr. Richards well? We've worked together many times. Had he ever displayed any unusual behavior? Nothing like this. What was his relationship like with the deceased? Well, as far as I know, they'd only just met. Can you think of any reason why he would want to kill her? Certainly not. Thank you, Mr. Cordier. Oh, and uh, I'll be needing this film. What's all this bloody nonsense, McNabb? Halloween gets worse every year. Oh, I like the owl, though. Other Wednesday. Ah. Oh, bloody hell. <sighs> Sorry, sir. <laughs> Where'd you get that? Scared the life out of me. Well, they sell them all over town. Half the city's dressing as a clown this year, sir. Because of the clown killing all those people last year. How charming. It's funny. It's not funny, Henry. The clown killings have resumed. The killer, Jack Richards, is an actor who is playing the killer clown. Wasn't the clown a pair of sisters? Movie magic, or so I'm told. Does this new killer know them? There seems to be no direct connection aside from the film and the story. Heather and Lee Iverson have been sentenced and are in prison awaiting their hangings. A copycat, then? No sign of him? Constables have his photograph and are searching the streets as we speak. In the meantime, I have evidence of the killing itself. Murdoch, don't you have your own tailor? No, oh, I was going to surprise Julia with a Halloween costume this year, but it seems I'll be working. There we are. Hmm. What is it? This shoe. Something on it? 
Dirt, mud, blood. I'm responsible for every piece of every costume. I would never have allowed him in front of the camera with dirty shoes. When was the last time you saw him uh, prior to the scene? A few minutes before. There was nothing on his shoe. Where might Mr. Richards have gone while he waited for the scene to begin? There's a small dressing room down the hall there. Oh. Thank you, Miss Canmore. Henry. Have you found anything? No sign of anything that could have mussed up his shoes, sir. All right, come with me. Sir, I hesitate to state the obvious, but this man murdered someone. Does it really matter how his shoes got dirty? You could be right, Henry. Maybe nothing. Henry, th this is Jack Richards. He was hit on the head, likely hard enough to knock him out. And what about the other blood? Uh, stabbed multiple times. So presumably the killer knocked him out, stole his costume, then stabbed him. This is looking more and more like the killings from last year. I hate to admit it, but they'll likely kill again. Five bedrooms, three bathrooms, two parlors, two telephones, and a swimming pool. Ah, oh, it's marvelous. It's rather grand for one person, isn't it? Claude and I will soon marry. Oh? <gasps> There's no telling how many additions to the family will follow. It's hard to imagine Louise Cherry as a family woman. I would have said the same thing about Julia Ogden not too long ago. Oh, oh. oh. beg your pardon. Hello? Hello, is someone there? Is this some sort of joke? Fire cleans the sins. What? Just that. Hello? Hello? What was it? What was that? I don't know. A voice? Hello? What did they say? He said, fire cleans the sins. Do you think it could have been the killer? I need to check the doors. Lucy, <gasps> oh. Lucy. Lucy, what's the matter? I, I thought it was We just had a call. We think it could have been the killer. Fire cleans the sins. And that's all he said? Yes. He spoke slowly. His voice was distorted. Distorted how? Strange, deep, eerie. I've never heard anything quite like it. And there was no music box like last year? No, just the voice. And you have no idea who might have done this? I wrote the book on this case, Detective. There are countless readers who might want to torment me. The knife used on both bodies is the same. At least eight inches in length, two inches at its widest point. Matching the knife that was found by the actress's body. It's a common size, but it does happen to be identical to the size of the weapon used in last year's murders. Of course. Thank you, Mrs. Hart. It's a copycat, then, like I said. But the telephone call to Miss Cherry was lacking any of the hallmarks from last year's calls. No music box. And instead, fire cleans the sins, followed by what Miss Cherry describes as terrible moaning. We've got two dead actors and a threat to the right of Miss Cherry. It must have something to do with the moving picture. Every person that was on that film set is a suspect. And I have constables guarding each of the cast members. Save for one who's unaccounted for, a Jesse Fraser playing one of the teener victims. He could be at risk. Or could be the killer. Sirs, I checked the finger marks on the murder weapon against those of the suspects in last year's killings. We have a match. Who? That's the thing, sir. It isn't one of the suspects, per se. It's one of the killers. What? How is that possible? I don't know, sir. But the finger marks belong to Lee Iverson. The 
The murders happened on the set of a film based on Louise Cherry's book. They're making a movie about us? Yes. Oh, my. Did you hear that, Heather? The killer used the same murder weapon that you used last year. In fact, your finger marks were on it. Were they? Do you have any idea how that came to be? I'm locked up, detective. They refuse to hang us, you know. They say we're too mad. I'm aware that you aren't the killer, Miss Iverson. But did you perhaps give the knife to someone prior to your incarceration? We had many knives. And what about you, Miss Iverson? Why should we tell you anything? I'd prefer if your sister answered. She can't. Why not? The custodian left some cleaning solution. She tried to kill herself again. The acid only burned away at her throat. I'm sorry. Please answer the question. I remember the knife. I know where it is. Before I tell you, I want you to do something for us. What? We'd like to see the movie. That's not possible. It isn't finished yet. Someone was murdered during the filming. I, I can provide you with other scenes, if you like. What scene were they filming? When the murder happened? The reenactment of your first murder. Irene? Yes. We enjoyed that one. How was this girl killed? I can't disclose. Detective. How can I trust you with what I know about the knife if you won't trust me with the details of the murder? She was stabbed during the filming of the scene. The killer wore a facsimile of your clown costume. How many times? I beg your pardon? How many times was she stabbed? Several. And everyone watched her die? Yes. I left the knife in my house. It was hidden in the pantry beside the stove. So this is the Iverson house? Mm -hmm. It's been boarded up since we found the parents' bodies inside. Apparently, no one's wanted to buy it. Small wonder. If the knife's already gone, what are we hoping to find? Perhaps whoever took it has left some evidence behind. There's no knife in the pantry, sir. We'll need to look for finger marks. Food. And this tea's warm. Someone's here. Hello. How kind of you to stop by and visit me at home. What is your name, miss? Lee Iverson. Uh. Lee Iverson is in an asylum. She's a murderer. I'm not in an asylum. I live with my sister in our parents' house. I see. And where is your sister now? <laughs> that house is empty. It's abandoned because the Iverson sisters don't live there anymore. No. You're playing the role of Lee Iverson in a movie. Your name is Alma Greenway. Yes. 
Then why are you pretending to be Lee Iverson? Because I want to be Lee Iverson. I want to feel everything that she feels so that I can become her on screen. Miss Greenway, how long have you been living in the Iverson house? A few weeks. Did you happen to find a knife in the pantry? What knife? A large kitchen knife. No. Well, someone has. And it's likely that someone used that knife to kill two people on the set of your film, acting as Lee Iverson. So you can see why you make a very compelling suspect. Do you know when we'll resume filming? Thank you, detective. I knew I could trust you. I'll see to it that the warden provides you with a film projector. Now, do either of you know a Miss Alma Greenway? Who? She's an actress. She was to play you in the film. You recognize her? What do you think? Miss Iverson, please. This woman has been living in your old home. She impersonates you. She seems to believe that she is you. You think she's the killer? That's what I'm trying to ascertain. You're smarter than that, detective. Look at her. She's a fake. That doesn't mean she isn't the murderer. Of course it does. In my experience, anyone can kill if the circumstances are right. This killer isn't just anyone. This killer looked into the dying eyes of a human being and stabbed her again and again until the light went out. You've only seen her photograph. How do you know what she's capable of? She writes to us. Her letters expose her nature. She's a rich little daddy's girl, pretending that life is hard. What's this? The letters. From Miss Greenway? Amongst others, we have many admirers. This holiday is too much bloody trouble. That's just a bit of fun, sir. What harm is there in dressing up and getting into a little mischief? Everybody's dressed as a clown. What? What? I don't have any bloody candy. What is it? Sir, look. Is that it? A... Yes, it is. Call the fire brigade, Higgins. Sir. Everyone get away. Now. Judging by the width of the pelvis, I believe he's a male. But the body is too badly burned to glean anything else at this stage. Do you think there's any chance of determining the cause of death? I'm not optimistic, but I will continue with the postmortem. Miss Greenway's in our cells. Does this mean she's not our killer? I suppose she could have killed whoever this is prior to our arresting her. I'll do my best to determine the time of death. Thank you, Mrs. Hart. It may be a late night. Fire cleans the sins. Miss Cherry's caller. Do you think he was talking about this? If he was, what was this man's sin? All right, that's enough. <laughs> Come, come, Louise. We'll marry soon enough. And I am saving myself until that time has come to pass. <clears throat> Not cross with me, are you? On the contrary. This is precisely why I adore you so. You're not like the other woman I've courted. Should hope not. Not like one of your actresses. Indeed. I love you, Louise Cherry. Oh. Who am I? Oh, if you excuse me, I'm gonna freshen up. Hello? 
Who is this? Why are you calling me? You have to die. You all have to die. Hello? Claude? Claude, you were out of the room last time he called. If you have anything to do with this, I swear I will... Did you make that call? You didn't. Did you kill those people? Damn it, Claude, answer me. charged at me. We fought. He was about to kill me, so I took the knife out of Claude to defend myself. That's when he backed off. Then he ran, and I called you. You pulled the knife out of Mr. Cordier? Yes. There was a telephone call prior to the clown appearing. Same as before. But this time he said, you have to die. You all have to die. He clearly has some unfinished business, which would suggest that he will call again. Perhaps we can use that to our advantage. Any calls to your home will be rerouted here. The inspector and I will listen in on separate receivers. All the switchboard operators have been apprised. <laughs> Any incoming call asking for you, and they'll contact the forwarding operator to locate the caller. What do you need from me? When he calls, Talk to him for as long as possible. The longer that you can keep him talking, the better chance we have of getting to him before he hangs up and runs off. Appeal to him. Ask him what he wants. Tell him what he wants to hear. But whatever you do, keep him on the line. I'm a journalist. I know how to get people to talk. <clears throat> Miss Cherry? We can suspend our endeavor if you are in need of sleep. I want this to be over. I'd sit by the telephone for days if it would help. Operator, we're on. Hello? Hello, who is this? Tell me what you want. I can help. I want you to die. Why? Why do you want me dead? What did I do? What was that? Nothing. Who's there? I knocked something over. No. Hello? Hello? The forwarding operator lost the caller. He was routed through another exchange. We were so close. I'm sorry, sir. I did not... I thought I told you to get rid of that bloody mask. It was an accident, sir. Oh, we're on again. Hello? I know who you're with. I'm not with anyone. Liar. You think you're so innocent. But you're not. You're right. So let me tell the truth for once. Let me tell your story. The world deserves to hear it. Yes, brilliant. 
Just tell me what you want. Tell me who you are. Back. Excellent work, Miss Cherry. We have the address. No one. He ran off before we got here. He must have known we were coming. Whose house is this? We're looking into it. Crikey, look at all this stuff. Killer left plenty of evidence behind. Sir, this is a child's toy, and it's coupled to the telephone. Hello. Hello. This guy's in his voice. And these papers and the articles are filled with information about last year's murders. Correspondence? Yes. From whom? Unsigned. But they all appear to be from the same person. They're collaborating with the killer, providing him with information, encouraging him. Encouraging him to kill? Oh, my. What's this? A piece of correspondence between you and the clown killer. <laughs> That's impossible. I didn't write that. It bears your signature, and the handwriting is a match. Someone must have copied it. In it, you explicitly request... I didn't write it. The author explicitly requests that the clown kill Claude Cordier. Why would I want Claude dead? The author says that Cordier was a sinner and that he had betrayed you. He would never. He was having an affair with Frances Turner, the young woman playing you in the film. Frances. She adored Claude, but he was finished with her ages ago. So you don't believe they were continuing to see one another? No. Therefore, you have no reason to doubt Mr. Cordier's loyalty to you. None. Then why were you so unaffected by his death? What do you mean? You saw the man killed before your own eyes. Y you pulled the knife out of his back. My emotions are my own. I reveal them only when I choose to do so. Miss Cherry. All of this correspondence appears to be from you, petitioning the recipient to adopt the clown killer persona and continue with the murders. Why would I do that? You say so yourself. You needed another hit book. With you at the center, you were writing your own sequel. You believe her? Miss Cherry has proven time and again that she's willing to sacrifice her morals for her career. If she was behind it, why did the killer nearly murder her in her own home? It's also suspicious that the caller knew to flee before we arrived and conveniently left a mound of evidence specifically implicating her. Gentlemen? Oh, Mrs. Hart. Have you completed the postmortem on our burn victim? I have. The fire burned him so badly there was little left to learn, but his left arm fared better than his right. The top layer of skin was charred, but underneath I found scar tissue. What kind of scar? A neat slice on his left forearm. Left forearm, you say? That's correct. I'll need a photograph of that scar, Mrs. Hart. Oh, of course. The scars are the same. Meaning? This is a photograph that we took last year of Perry Balfour's arm. Irene Robbins' paramour. He was there when she was killed, but if you recalled, he was too scared to do anything and then inflicted this wound on his own arm. Irene Robbins was the clown's first victim last year. And the clown's first victim this year is the woman who played her in the film. So she's the connection. Someone's avenging her death. And anyone who exploited it, such as the writer of the book, the director of the film. Have Higgins look into her family and friends. One of them may be the killer. There is something else, sir. I've been reading the letters that the Iverson sisters received. Admittedly, most of them are from admirers who are smitten with them. But one is different. The writer vows revenge and wrote, you all must die. Just like the caller. Anonymous? Unfortunately, yes. But the Arverson sisters may have some idea of the author's identity. Right. I need to see to Miss Greenway. The actress? 
the same. Her father's a crown attorney. He wants his daughter out of the cells. And we've got no reason to hold her, given that she was locked up when Miss Cherry's beau was killed. She may not be the killer, but she could be in danger. I'll keep an eye on her. You recognize this letter? What does it say? It's from someone who accuses you of murdering their child. Unfortunately, it's anonymous. So you no longer believe the actress did it? No. The killings have continued. How would I know more than what you're seeing in front of you? And perhaps whoever wrote you this letter has written you others. I told you, Detective. Lots of people write to us. Maybe whoever wrote it is a parent, or maybe they're just a lunatic. What's this? What's what? Guard! Oh. Guard! Nothing. Turn on the lights! Good God. What have you done? It's what she wanted. Sir? Sir, are you all right? Henry. Yes, what have you? Irene Robbins' family left Toronto after the murder. They moved to Hamilton. Have you been able to contact them? Uh, not directly, sir. They don't have a telephone in their home. But I was able to track down Mr. Robbins' employer. He worked a full shift today at Woodbridge Electric Company. Sir? Henry, part of this contraption, yes, it was made in that factory. But, sir, he was at work all day. Perhaps his employer was mistaken. Henry, go and find the inspector and alert him. I'll telephone the Hamilton police and have them go around to the Robbins home. Yes, sir. The Robbins file's on my desk. Miss Greenway, I'd feel much more comfortable escorting you to your home. This is my home. Your real home. I feel comfortable here. Thank you, Inspector. Now, when can I have my clothes back? Your clown costume is evidence. Constable Evans here will keep an eye on you to the morning. Ma'am. There's no one there. Bloody hell, she's gone. Evans? Yes, Robbins. R-O-B-B-I-N-S. That's right. Thank you, Detective. No, sir. She's gone. Do you think she might be the killer, sir? There's no telling what's going on. It's only me, sir. Bloody hell, Higgins. Did you see Miss Greenway? No, sir. This is what Irene would have wanted. Your daughter was murdered, and that isn't right. But would she want her father to become a murderer? <laughs> The costume lady. No, you're Irene Robin's mother. That's right. And she would have wanted me to kill every last one of them. I don't regret a thing. I wanted everyone involved in Irene's death to pay. Starting with that coward who watched her die. Harry Balfour. You should have seen his face. He knew what he'd done. When the knife went in, he knew he deserved it. Why go after the others? They didn't murder your daughter. They sought money and fame, paid for with Irene's blood. I had to stop them. And yet you didn't pursue the killers themselves. It was Lee Iverson and her sister who 
who killed your daughter. You were supposed to hang them. You failed her. That's why I came for you. I'm only tasked with arresting criminals and providing evidence to the Crown. They should be dead. Four bodies. All your fault, detective. I hope it was enough. I hope Irene can rest now. Revenge, plain and simple. There is one question that remains, sir. Why concoct evidence implicating Louise Cherry? She blamed Cherry as much as the rest of the victims. That's why she tried to kill her. Why do both? Sirs, bad news. We found another body. It's Jesse Fraser. The actor that we couldn't find was found stabbed in an alley a few blocks from the film set. When? How long has he been dead? A witness saw a clown run from the scene about an hour ago. Mrs. Robbins could have done it before we arrested her. Sir, she only confessed to four murders. The two actors, Perry Balfour and Mr. Cordier, Mr. Fraser would make five. Maybe she didn't kill this one. Or maybe she didn't kill one of the others. Then someone else is out there killing. Are you going to be all right, Louise? I don't know. I just can't believe that Claude is gone. It's truly awful. Never should have written that book house, everything it bought. It's blood money. You can't blame yourself. You're a victim of this madness. <gasps> Louise! You're so pure and perfect. <gasps> How can we get you to the hospital? <gasps> I want you dead! You've resumed filming already. We're about to. The show must go on, as they say. All new actors. Hardly had any choice there. Who's going to direct? Me. It's what Claude would have wanted. And you know how to do that? It's just telling people what to do. How hard can it be? Uh, oh, and tell William thank you. Oh, for what? He gave me an idea. I'm going to write the sequel. Wow. It might be difficult to recapture the success of the original. However, in light of us vanquishing Miss Turner together, I imagine there might be a character based on me. I think it will play better if I just kill her myself. Oh. What are we waiting on? Why aren't we rolling? William, I'm home. Oh, uh, um, stay right there. Whatever are you doing back there? Uh, it's a little Halloween surprise. Well, Halloween was weeks ago. I wanted to do something special, and we were both a little preoccupied. Well, hurry up, whatever it is. And where is Susanna? <laughs> oh, my! Thank you for coming. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> Ah, yes. <laughs> <sighs> How I love the English countryside. Oh. <clears throat> uh, yes, it's like a, a Jane Austen novel with less courses. 
And you are. Ah, Mr. and Mrs. Crabtree. Ah, yes, I'm newlyweds. I hope your ride in was satisfactory. Splendid. Are you Mr. Cornish? Mr. Hathaway. I'll be looking after you. Now, let's get you your keys. Oh, George, look. I can't wait to try authentic English cuisine. Welsh rabbit. Rabbit. It's cheese. Hmm. I think. Well, we'll have to make dinner reservations as soon as he's back. Well, wouldn't you like to eat in our room? The Sunrise Suite is the best in the hotel. It's the only one with a private bathroom. Isn't that the one we agreed was too expensive? I've been corresponding with Mr. Cornish, and he agreed to offer it to us at no extra charge. The morning view is supposedly spectacular. Well, I hope we'll find something better to do than watch the sunrise. Here we are, then. Slatter will lead you to your suite. Oh, my. Oh my. How kind of you. Slatter does not speak English. However, she is fluent in the language of hospitality. Enjoy your stay. Oh, uh, there seems to be some mistake. I beg your pardon? These keys are for the garden suite. Mr. Cornish promised us the sunrise suite. Mr. Cornish is at a convention in Leeds. But it is he who authorized the switch. The garden suite is our top room, with finer amenities and a view of the rose garden. I assure you, your needs will be met. You're welcome. I supposed to give her a tip? How many shillings in a fur are they? What's wrong? This bed feels lumpy. And those creatures are ghastly. Well, you'll feel better once you take in the rose garden. Come on. Uh, what do you think? I think Mr. Hathaway is pulling a fast one. You may need to let this go, Effie. I mean, somebody else must have booked this on my suite. There's not much we can do about it now. <clears throat> I think it'll take more than a bottle of wine to pull this off, Effie. Don't be such a naysayer. I'm sure they'll be happy to switch once they learn we're on our honeymoon. I don't know why you think this room is going to be any better than ours. Well, you haven't seen it yet. Faces the sunrise, which is considered good luck. Give it a proper policeman's knock. So lucky after all. Oh, postcard from Effie and George. Oh, where are they now? They've left Paris and they're due to arrive in Hampshire today. How thrilling it would be to be on your honeymoon. It certainly was for us. Do you remember that dinner in New York City? <laughs> How could I forget? We couldn't keep our eyes off each other. So much so we almost didn't notice the oysters Rockefeller arriving. <laughs> I suppose it's hard to keep that kind of passion alive. What with Susanna and work. Do you feel our relationship is lacking passion? Hello. Yes, it is. I'll be right there. Duty calls. Hmm. Excuse me, miss. I'm looking for room 415. The man who died? Uh, yes, you've heard. I alerted the front desk when he wouldn't answer the door. None of us were surprised when he took his own life. He was acting peculiar. It was a suicide. As far as I know. Straight down the hall, second door to your left. Thank you. This one seems rather obvious. An overdosing? 
based on the empty bottle of laudanum and excess fluid in his throat. I'd say yes. Do we have a name? Nathan Cumberland, sir. He arrived last week from Thunder Bay. Told everyone in the hotel that his ship had finally come in. Meaning? Uh, some real estate deal, sir. Poor man thought he had tripled his money. He was buying his fellow guest drinks all week and boasting about finally making his wife and child proud. And his arrangement soured. Apparently the check he received was fraudulent and his investor flew the coop. The other guests noted a concerning change in his demeanor after that. Henry, does this man look familiar to you? Nope. Should he? I don't know. Uh, sir, this is Dr. Bellows. He was with the victim when he perished. You're a doctor? Yes. Yes, I'm staying at the hotel. They knocked on my door when they found him. I did everything I could. Was he conscious when you arrived? Barely. But he did seem to understand me. He willingly took the Ipecac I gave him to expel the drugs. Unfortunately, it was too late. People often have a change of heart when committing self-murder. Assuming that's what this was. It's likely, sir. He also left this. It appears to be a suicide note. I am leaving a world I am not fit to live in. I have failed you as a husband, as a father, and as a fellow human being. It's tragic. Is there anything else you need from me? I'm afraid I have an appointment. Uh, no, thank you. Constable Higgins has all my information. Good day. Seems fairly open and shut, sir. Shall I write it up? Not quite yet, Henry. There's something I'd like you to do for me. <laughs> I trust this will not impact my eight o'clock dinner reservations. Not if I can help it. Good <clears throat> evening, my lovelies. I'm sure we've all heard about the incident, but I can assure you everything is fine. His name was Arthur Furlong, a regular at this hotel. It appears he died in his sleep, and his family has been informed. Please enjoy some of our famous house sherry. Compliments of the hotel. And please, let's relax and put this mess behind us. Good gracious. People drink this of their choice? You think there's a killer among us? A killer? Effie, did you not just hear what the man said? Oh, come now. You really believe he died in his sleep? He couldn't have been a day over 50. People can die at any age. Mr. Hathaway is clearly in on it. In fact, now that everyone's mingling, it's a perfect time. Perfect time for what? To sneak into the room and poke around. Effie, I'm an officer of the law. Exactly. All the more reason. If there is a cover-up afoot, it's your duty as an investigator to follow up. People do seem distracted. Did I mention that danger makes me amorous? I'll need your uh, hairpin. Hmm. Never seen him before. Are you certain? Yes. Why not just close the file and be done with it? Poor bugger clearly offed himself. He was supposedly swindled by an investor in a real estate scam, but I found no paperwork on his person or any sign of the investor. You think there was no investor? Or perhaps there was, but he removed any evidence to cover his tracks. Sirs, I've searched our files and found no Nathan Cumberland. In fact, there's no record of him anywhere. Uh, but in good news, there's a new meat pie shop on Colborne. May I break for lunch? Actually, I need you to pay a visit to Mrs. Hart at the morgue. Uh, the meat pie shop's in the opposite direction, sir. You might want to hold off on lunch. I need you to lift finger marks off a corpse. Oh. oh, my. They have a love seat. And a piano. Are you crazy? There is no chance the garden suite is the top suite in this hotel. Wait a minute. Are we doing all this so you could compare suites? Oh, come on, George. You were curious, too. Oh, I don't believe it. Do you even think this chap was murdered? Ah, <gasps> Lavender. It smells like the fields of Somerset. Effie, the door. Get under the bed.
Henry, did you get the finger marks? Uh, yes, sir, and you were right. Nathan Cumberland is actually Harvey Knowles, and we do have a file on him. Guess who opened it? Oh. Afternoon, detective. You know perfectly well I'm no longer a detective. I do indeed, but I'm hoping I can convince you to play one, at least for an afternoon. I'm looking into a man's death. Oh, you certainly are consistent. Uh, his name is uh, Harvey Knowles. Why did he have a gun? What was he doing in here? George, look. The lavender soap, it's gone. I suppose even murderers want a supple scent to their skin. <laughs> oh, my God. This is so exciting. I feel my heart. It's pounding. died on this bed. Who cares? <sighs> 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 this that doesn't look right this hose has been disconnected do you feel a little nauseous oh my god it's gas that was on purpose wasn't it someone was venting carbon monoxide into the room what does this mean what i think it means it means you were right the first time mr furlong didn't die of natural causes he was murdered Well, it's too late to alert the authorities, and we're a half day from civilization thanks to your insistence on booking the most remote hotel in the Western Hemisphere. You're not really still on about that inn in Marseille you were pushing for. No, I'm sorry. Look, we should work together. Agreed. We're the only ones we can trust. Someone's gone to great lengths to make Mr. Furlong's death look accidental. The Sunrise Suite is the only one with a private bathroom. Which means it's the only one that can be rigged to emit carbon monoxide. Ergo, whoever arranged the switch must be in on it. Mr. Hathaway. I knew there was something off about him. He must have made the switch when Mr. Cornish left for me. And then pretended the idea came from Mr. Cornish himself. How do we prove it? I saw a ledger behind the desk. It should tell us everything. How do we get it without Hathaway's aid? I have an idea. Mrs. Crabtree. Oh. Are you enjoying the splendors of the garden suite? Oh, indeed, indeed. Now, who's this? That's Mr. Cornish. There seem to be many photos of him and none of you. Not all of us are as vain as he. You don't like him, do you? Are you jealous that he's been invited to a convention in Leeds while you're stuck here? I wouldn't wish Leeds on anyone, least of all myself. <laughs> Besides, Mr. Cornish has seniority over me. Thus, it was the logical choice. Yes, that's one theory. Allow me to posit another. Mr. Cornish was chosen over you because as a manager, he would never have put up with this. <laughs> we found this in our room. Is this the type of service becoming of your supposed top suite? Please, keep your voice down. I will not be silenced. Not until you tell me how a mouse got into my suite. How about a fruit plate? 
A lovely selection of fruits will be on their way to your room. Compliments of the house. And a cheese plate? Yes, of course. Also complimentary. And a bottle of Armagnac. I can arrange some of our fine house sherry. Armagnac. Take or leave. 20 years minimum. Perhaps I can also up a 10. That may suffice. And you need to promise to keep this little incident under wraps. That'll depend on how quickly we get the goods. Chop, chop. I employed Harvey Knowles on occasion as an informant. He used to run swindles. Knowles was a con artist. Mm, charming one at that. Surprised to see him die this way. You don't believe Knowles took his own life? I don't believe Knowles would have fallen for a real estate scam. What makes you so sure? Well, he would have known what a fraudulent check looked like because he ended up running a fraudulent check scheme himself, which was rather out of character. How so? Knowles and his former partner in crime, Bernadette Childs, had a code in which they only swindled those they felt deserved it. They parted ways years earlier. Did he find another partner? If he did, that's news to me. Knowles was a solitary figure who kept to himself, and I haven't seen him in over a year. Well, surely he must have a more current acquaintance that could help us. No one I know. Although, I do recall a wealthy woman he was courting. What was her name? I'm sure I wrote it down somewhere. No, she'd be of little use. Little is all we have. I cannot believe it. My beloved Harvey taking his own life. Did he strike you as depressed? Oh, heavens, no. But he did strike me as passionate. I can only assume he was burdened by the passing of his beloved Aunt Esther. Which aunt was this again? Oh, his favorite, of course. The one who raised him after his parents died in that fire. Did you know this woman? We corresponded often by mail. We never did meet in person, but I suppose it's for the best given her condition. Mm hmm. Yeah, refresh my memory. Oh, the poor woman suffered from tuberculosis. She was given months to live. But then Harvey found a revolutionary clinic in New York. New York? That sounds like a costly undertaking. Oh, it was, but it was worth it. The clinic prolonged her life by years. I was happy to chip in, buoyed by her lovely thank you letters. Uh, these letters she sent, do you by chance still have them? Good Lord, I knew it. What is it? The Sunrise Suite, not the Garden Suite, is the top suite. That's all well and good, but perhaps we should focus on who switched the rooms. Right, Constable, we are solving a murder here. This is curious. George, it wasn't Mr. Furlong who took our room. Who did? A man named Mr. Castle. And the switch was authorized by Mr. Hathaway, not Mr. Cornish. Castle, isn't he the chap with the 8 p.m. dinner reservation? So how did Mr. Castle and Mr. Furlong end up switching rooms? Well, if Castle was in the Sunrise Suite, where was Furlong? Arthur Furlong, the Oak Suite. Does that mean Castle's in the Oak Suite now? Perhaps Mr. Castle rigged his room to emit carbon monoxide and then convinced Mr. Furlong to switch. Hell of a way to commit a discreet murder. Do you think Mr. Castle and Mr. Hathaway could be working together? I think we need to get into that oak suite and see what we can find. You said he had 8 p.m. dinner reservations? It's quarter past eight now. That room should be empty for another hour at least. What if we get caught? Then we pretend we're lost and tip immediately. Shilling. Now, is that more or less than a farthing? I don't think anybody knows. Let's get on with it. Parents who died in a fire. That's quite the yarn. Sometimes the bigger the lie, the easier it is to tell. Well, just as I suspected, the handwriting in Aunt Esther's thank you letters matches that of Harvey Knoll's suicide note. He was posing as the grateful aunt to keep those checks coming. Something tells me it isn't the first time that he's pulled this scheme. Leaving a number of potential victims with motive for murder. The question is, where did he send these from? Certainly not New York, given the Ontario stamp. Aha. Uh -huh. 
Oh, Miss Alcock is not the sharpest tool in the shed. What's that? A mistake? Mm, seems oddly placed for a mistake. Is that some sort of flower? A lily. Did I not see that on the sign at Hotel Florentine? I'll have Henry connect with the concierge. Oh, that is so not fair. This room has a chaise lounge. Effie, focus. Right. Do you see anything unusual? Only that Mr. Castle has exceptional taste in clothes. This is one of the most finely tailored shirts I've ever seen. Feel this. GR hardly stands for Ernest Castle. Oh, my. Good Lord, his soap collection costs more than my entire wardrobe. Is that a gun case? Where's the gun? What a tragedy. Uh, poor Granville. Granville. Granville? Oh, uh, Granville Barrington. Uh -huh. uh, he was uh, a favorite guest at the Florentine. Uh, <laughs> every guest was charmed and delighted by him. He was quite a character. Well, when did he stay there? Uh, it must have been uh, two months ago. He, he came in to cash in on a real estate deal, but unfortunately, the investor bamboozled him. Let me guess, he gave Granville a fraudulent check and left town? Why, yes. Uh, he took it very hard. Mm. Uh, uh, he tried to end his own life. And we are all very grateful there happened to be a doctor at the hotel. Who administered Ipecac in order to expel the laudanum he'd ingested? Right again. Uh, it was quite the scene, huh? Everyone was grateful to see Granville survive. Uh, the doctor even spearheaded a charity drive to get him back on his feet. And uh, everyone chipped in. The doctor who gave him the Ipecac, do you remember his name? Uh, Bellows, Dr. Gordon Bellows. What's your business with Mr. Castle? Well, you know, really, we were just uh, interested in the layout of the room. And, uh, oh, you should see the soap. <laughs> 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 George! What? Oh. Bunk, get back here. Get back. Now I'm going to ask you one last time. What exactly is your business with Mr. Castle? You're not Mr. Castle. You're George V, the King of England. G.R. George Rex for the king. That's why you had those initials in your undergarments. You saw my undergarments? I can't believe we're sitting here with the king of England. Keep your voice down. He is the king, and he could have you charged with treason. So what are you doing in Hampshire? I am much more interested in why the two of you are here. Well, we came for the lovely foliage in the world-class buffet. I mean, why you are here in my room. Oh, Your Majesty, please, accept our humble apologies. I'm George Crabtree with the Toronto Constabulary, and I'm here on honeymoon with my wife, Effie. You're a police officer. I've been in Canada, that's right. Police or no police, you still need to explain why you are in my room. Well, the truth is, Your Majesty, we found evidence that Arthur Furlong, the man staying in the Sunrise Suite, was murdered. Carbon monoxide. Somebody tampered with the gas heater in his ensuite bathroom. We were curious only because we were initially assigned that room. If this is true, Your Majesty, our worst fears are confirmed. What you are about to hear must be kept in the strictest of confidence, by order of the Crown. Yes, yes, Your Majesty. The reason my valet Wadsworth and I are traveling incognito is to visit my troubled son, Edward, who is honing his academics at a special school in Portsmouth. It was a risk I was willing to take, even given the presence of the Black Chalice. The Black Chalice is a secretive organization pushing back on my plans to reform the hereditary peerage. We've long suspected that there might be members in these parts, and evidently we were right. You see, 
Wadsworth secured me the hotel's top suite, which we must have unknowingly taken from you. I was unable to take my afternoon nap on account of my grievous musophobia. Musophobia? Is that a British affliction? Um, His Majesty is fearful of mice. Ah. So I fled my suite and neglected to inform me and happened upon Mr. Furlong enjoying a cigar in the garden. I explained my situation and he offered to switch since my room was clearly superior. Now that we know the room had been tampered with, the only conclusion is that we were the target. We? His Majesty is using the royal we. So what is your, our, our plan? We will do nothing. But there's a murderer out there. Given that their first attempt was a failure, they're unlikely to strike again tonight so long as they assume we're not onto them. Now please, return to your room and pretend you know nothing. I will arrange for His Majesty to be escorted to safety at dawn. You will remember me only as Ernest Castle, and you will never speak of this again. I checked with the Canadian Medical Registry. Dr. Gordon Bellows has been dead for five years. The person posing as him has procured a pretty penny off his name. It's quite the brilliant scheme he and his partner Knowles had going. Knowles would check into a hotel posing as a man whose ship had come in. And his partner in crime posing as Dr. Bellows would show up several days later. Then Knowles would reveal that his windfall had backfired and made clear that he intended to take his own life, going so far as to ingest laudanum. Dr. Bellows would be called in and use Ipecac to expel the laudanum, creating a scene so authentic no one would dare question it. The perfect opening to mount an appeal for money in Knowles' name, and then milking the hotel guests for everything they're worth. He probably volunteered a large portion of his own money from the very first time they pulled this con. Well, Harvey Knowles' murder seems to be coming into sharper focus. Apparently, the swindler got swindled. His partner likely offed him to keep all the money. Let's get a sketch of this medical imposter straight away. I'll connect with our sketch artist and make sure Henry distributes it all over town. One thing that bothers me. Hotel guests saw the doctor give the victim Ipecac. Why didn't it work? Hmm. Once I deliver the sketch, I'll drop in on Mrs. Hart at the morgue. Uh, do you mind if I take along? You're not getting paid. Oh. The King of England. Can you believe that just happened? No, nor will anyone else. No one will believe this happened to us. George, if Mr. Hathaway is a member of the Black Chalice, do you think he's working shh, alone? Shh, or... shh, shh. We need to keep our voices down. We made a promise to the Crown. Then I suppose we have no choice but to get back to why we came here in the first place. As suspected, his blood was saturated with opium and alcohol, the main ingredients in laudanum. Why wasn't it expelled? Uh, Witnesses saw Knowles be administered Ipecac. They might have seen him take some kind of syrup, but it wasn't Ipecac. I found traces of starches and sugars, nothing else. Could our fake doctor have switched the Ipecac for a placebo syrup? If he did, he's guilty of murder. You're welcome. Oh. Uh. Oh. Hathaway can't be working alone. I bet she's in on it. Maybe they're all in on it. Should we follow her? Julia? Hello, stranger. What's all this? Do you recognize this dress? It's lovely. Should I? I wore it on our honeymoon. The uh, night we couldn't take our eyes off each other. Oh. <laughs> the nanny has taken Susanna to the park. We have some time to kill. Oh, uh, Julia. 
I must admit, you've caught me off guard. Uh, uh. Hello? Yes. Which intersection? I'll be right there. Julia, a man matching Dr. Bellow's description has been spotted. We'll have to delay our date, but only a little. It was there, in the ruins of Thebes, where we found the lost tomb of Asclepius and discovered the healing properties of its sands. Sprinkle a few grains in your bed and watch as back pain, rheumatism, and arthritis disappear overnight. This miracle of the East can be yours for less than the cost of... Terribly sorry, ladies and gentlemen. We've just run out. Seems curious that they need to lock the coal room. Unless it serves some other purpose, like secret meeting room for the Black Chalice. Yes, I, I've engaged in a swindle or two in my time to make ends meet, but I'm not a murderer. You gave your partner a benign syrup when he was expecting Ipecac. Harvey was like a brother to me. Why would I want him dead? to reap his half of the profits, for starters. We were going to pull our hotel con in every province in the country. And we hadn't even finished Ontario yet. Yes, Detective Harvey was a financial windfall to me, but more important, he was my best friend. I am as devastated and confused by his death as everyone else is. May I please leave now? Thank you, gentlemen. I think I can take it from him. Off he goes to swindle again. Most likely. You have to admit, his story rings true. I don't disagree. Why go through lengths to switch the Ipecac when he could have ignored the call in the first place? Unless someone else switched it without his knowledge. But who would have access to his room. Friend? Perhaps this warrants another visit to the hotel. Well, I don't think the Black Chalice are holding any meetings in here. Let's just pretend to get some coal and go back to our room. Well, well we could if we had a coal shovel. You lost it, remember? No, dear, you lost it. In any case, I'll get some firewood. Georgie, I hate to bring this up, but it was you who lost the shovel. No, Effie, I clearly remember you had it when you were saying it felt drafty. No, I the... distinct... Ah! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! It's Mr. Cornish! I guess he didn't make it to that convention in Leeds after all. Your Majesty. Uh, Mr. Castle, we hate to bother you, but we've got a bit of a situation. This had better be good. We were collecting firewood. My wife and I discovered the body of Mr. Cornish. The day manager? No, he's at a convention in Leeds. No, he's in the coal room. He's been garroted. Proof positive that Mr. Hathaway is a member of the Black Chalice. And Slaughter, too, no doubt. She had a key to the room. I reckon the whole hotel is in on it. Well, this changes everything. The assailants are going to know that we're onto them. This may trigger a response. We need to leave now. Agreed. But Mr. Hathaway is likely to be Black Chalice. You two newlyweds are going to need to help us by creating a distraction so that we can slip away to the stables. How are we supposed to do that? What a petty hotel squabble should do the trick. Ten minutes tops is all we need, but it'll need to feel authentic. Can we count on you two? I don't understand. I thought Mr. Cumberland took his own life. His name was Harvey Knowles, and all is not what it seems. We need to know who among your staff would have access to room 415. This is a small private hotel, and I run a very tight ship. The only ones with access would be myself and my cleaner, Mabel. And I, for one, never left my desk. Well, then, we'll need to speak with your cleaner. 
I ran into her the morning that Mr. Knoll's body was found. Of course. She's right over there. Mabel? A word? Oh, this is not the woman that I met. Do you employ a different cleaner? Not for the last 20 years. The Crabtrees. How delightful. Did you enjoy the Armagnac? Oh, do not play nice with us, Hathaway. We were shocked to learn that the garden suite is not, in fact, your top suite, and we demand to know why you gave it away to Mr. Castle. Yes, we're all so upset. And when I say we, I, of course, mean her. Are we not a unified front on this? Unified? Oh, good Lord, George. Why did I ever marry you? No, I don't know. That's a good question. If you love this sunrise suite so much, perhaps you should marry Nothing me. To say. Have you lost Nothing your to mind like you lost your I little lost. shovel? Oh, carry on. Carry yes, on. Lo the lost the shovel. I'm the, yes, I'm the loser of all things, yes, aren't I? Yes, you lose things, George. You're yes. about to lose the best thing that ever happened to oh, you. Oh, well, maybe that wouldn't be such a bad thing to lose after all. I didn't mean that last part. Urgent message from Mr. Castle. Wadsworth is compromised. It wasn't supposed to get messy like this. All I had to do was authorize a room change, and they would do the dirty work. Oh, well. In for a penny, in for a pound. Found, Found the, the shovel. Effie, a telegram came through. Wadsworth is in on it. We need to warn the king. Yes, a much more delicate nose. How's this? That's it. Let's get this picture up all over town straight away. That may not be necessary. That's Bernadette Childs. Harvey Knowles, former partner? Yes. And I know where I might find her. Your Majesty. Your Majesty. We won't be needing this anymore. Old habits die hard, huh, Bernadette? Hello, Llewellyn. How'd you find me? The creature has a modus operandi. Even a rat. Is that all I am to you? A rat? I was your most valuable informant. We had interesting conversations back in the day. Me and you. And Harvey Knowles, fellow con you once called a friend. Why did you do it? Harvey broke the golden rule. A con capitalizes on greed, lust, vanity, but never human kindness. I couldn't sit by while he and his new partner swindled hotel guests who were only trying to be kind. You know, speaking of rules is the very definition of irony. Come on, Llewellyn. You once agreed with me on this. And it wasn't just the hotel guests Harvey swindled. It was his lover, his family, even me. A new partner of his must have rotted his brain. So that's why you switched the syrup? So Harvey would rot in a casket while his partner in crime rotted in jail? It was protecting our livelihood. He crossed the line. There's a code. There is indeed, which is why you need to come with me. Thank you for the gun, Mr. Crabtree. I'm so sorry you're about to use it to unknowingly assassinate the king. You know, I wasn't sure what to do with you two at first. And then the perfect narrative presented itself. An epic fight over the Sunrise Suite. That'll never work. You'd have to kill us, too. Precisely. Oh. Your authentic bickering is going to lend credence to my upcoming report. And it's going to confirm that you knocked Mr. Hathaway out, you stole his gun, and then you went after the man who unjustly took your honeymoon suite. Thanks to His Majesty's famous lust for guns, it is the only logical explanation as to why I found three dead bodies in the unfortunate aftermath of this shootout. You're welcome. I 
show the both of you my eternal gratitude. I'd knight you if I could, but unfortunately, I think this must be kept under wraps. We understand, Your Majesty. I know it's not much, but uh, please accept this small token as a measure of my appreciation. Oh my goodness. Your Majesty, thank you. I've also secured you something else. For your remaining time at this hotel, the Sunrise Suite is yours. Even better than knighthood. <laughs> <laughs> I must say, Detective, solving a case again was quite satisfying. For me and you both. Can I interest you in a celebratory cocktail? Alas, other plans are afoot. Ah. But I do hope we get to do this again, Watts. Soon. Yes. Told you this suite was lucky. Julia? William. I'm glad to see you back. Oh, it's good to be back. I'm sorry about before. I know how busy you are. And it was just a silly romantic notion. I should know that we can't just bring back the past. Oh, I wouldn't exactly say that. Rockefeller. Like our honeymoon dinner in New York. Only this time we'll definitely notice them arriving. You remembered our song. Of course. It was the greatest night of my life. Well, the night is still young. <laughs> <laughs> She'll be fine. Mm -hmm. 